Um, I've actually got, I've got several today. Um, go to the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to grab several right from the same few chapters there. Mark chapter 2, and I want to read verses 16 and 17. Also going to be on the screen behind me if uh, you don't have your Bible handy. It says this, uh, Mark chapter 2, verse 16, When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw Jesus eating with sinners and tax collectors... They asked the disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. All right, one more flip, just a few chapters ahead, and go to Mark uh, chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, and I want to jump in at verse 24. Say amen when you're there. I hear a few paper Bibles turn in, so I know there's still some anointing here today. The the digital copies just aren't quite as anointed, but they still get the job done. All right, verse 24, a large crowd followed and pressed around Jesus and a woman who was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Watch this, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. I wonder if anybody here today, you you just know, God has just done something for you. You just feel it deep down on the inside and nobody else can tell you otherwise that Jesus has set you free from some stuff that Jesus has forgiven you from some stuff you just feel it you feel it on that deepest place in verse 30 at once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him he had turned around in the crowd and asked who touched my clothes isn't that interesting that that it wasn't something that Jesus necessarily purposefully did but there was a withdrawal of power It was like somehow she just kind of snuck up and plugged into the power outlet that was Jesus. And the disciples said, you see the people crowding against you, and yet you ask, who touched me? They're kind of like, everybody's touching you. But you're asking, who touched me? But but there's a difference between being around Jesus, being in the vicinity of Jesus, and going to church, and and kind of going through the motions, and and being around around all of it, and then then touching Jesus. And she touched Jesus. Verse 32, but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And and I don't mean to sound sexist here, but when when the Bible says she told him the whole truth, I think, think like, come on, sometimes women do. She was like told the whole story. (laughs) Well, Jesus, I've been through it and I saw all these doctors and And we know she took a while to tell the whole truth because in the middle of all this, the appointment that Jesus was on the way to make to to raise up Jairus' daughter from this this, uh, sickbed, she actually went and died. So this took some time. And, And in verse 34, he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Your faith got you this one. Now go in peace and be freed from your suffering." All right, one more time, I'm going to make you talk to the person around you. I know it's awkward, but I love it. <laughs> and pick somebody around you and tell them this sermon is called Side Effects. Side Effects. Now, now turn to the other person so you get both sides and tell them this one's called Side Effects. You see what I did there? Sides and Side Effects. <laughs> side Effects. Um, so so let, me, let me ask you this today. What, what kind of person are you when, when you get sick? Because, you know, from time to time, we all, get, we all get a cold, we all get a cough, you know, we'll get a fever, um, we'll, we'll get COVID for the 17th time, whatever it might be. <laughs> when we get under the weather, there, there's a few different types of people when it comes to catching cold. Uh, some people, uh, when, when you catch a cold, um, you know you need to rest. And you are probably the wiser among us. Uh, sometimes... You're a little annoying because you also probably love to get sympathy. Come on. And uh, you're like, I'm sick. That's it. I'm going to bed. I'll see you in three days. But, but, but then you recover, and you're able to move on with your life. And, and some people, you know how to hit pause. 
Then there are those of us uh, that when we get sick, uh, no matter how sick we get, we attempt to carry on. We attempt to power through. We attempt to pretend like we're not actually sick and having a problem, and, and, and we freak out on all our friends because they're all telling us, you need to go home and get to bed, and you're infecting everyone, and you need to be quarantined, and, and I can be one of those people. Uh, in fact, a, a few, um, and don't get me wrong, I, I love to get sympathy from my wife, but, but I can be one of those people that when I get sick, I pretend like I have no problem. A few use, Easter's back, uh, when we were still in our old space on Indiana, I, any OGs in the house that were with us on Indiana, come on, all right. And uh, Easter was coming. It was, it was the week of Easter, and I had my message all prepared, and I was prayed up, and I was ready for God to move in power. And back then, because of our little space, we, we were just trying to make more room for all the people that were coming, so we had a Saturday worship experience. So Easter was going to be on Saturday and Sunday, and through the week I was feeling some symptoms, and... Uh, you know, like, like you do, I just kind of ignored the symptoms, but then instead of getting any better, I, I just got more sick, and, and then I continued to ignore them, and pretty soon I found myself laid up in bed, and I had such a, I, I was, I mean, this is probably TMI, but I was throwing up, and, and, and I, I was like hazy, I can't really even remember all what was going on, and I had a terrible fever, and so I was laid up in bed, and my wife would come in and check on me and from time to time, and she'd be like, hey, do you want me to text somebody from the team because Easter's coming and obviously you can't preach? And I was like, nah, I can preach. <laughs> I'm going to be fine. And the, she would leave and then it would be like several hours later, she would come back again and be like, you're still really sick. Should I text someone? They probably need time to prepare. And I was like, I'm fine, I can preach. And then Saturday, I text my wife to ask her because again, I, I was feverish and my memory was a little hazy. Saturday came around, the, the day of, and, and I went to get up to shower and to go preach, and actually as I got up, I fell over, and praise God, I happened to fall in the direction of my bed. <laughs> I didn't sit down, I fell down, and as I was laying there in my bed, I had an epiphany. I don't think I'm going to be able to preach tonight. <laughs> so I said, text him. And, and you all know and love the great right Reverend Jeff Cope, come on, full of the Holy Spirit, in season and out of season, ready to go. And, and so Jeff got a text that was something along the lines of, hey, get ready, uh, you're preaching tonight. And uh, from, from what I hear, preached a powerful Easter uh, sermon. And, and I was so dumb, I still got up the next day and I preached uh, Resurrection Sunday. And I probably looked, you know, kind of like like all gray, and, and people were probably frightened by my appearance, but I did it anyway, and uh, that's kind of how I am. In, in fact, just a few weeks back, they, they told me I had appendicitis, and uh, that I was going to need to get, you know, emergency surgery, and so I asked, <laughs> I asked the doctor, I said, well, hey, look, um, I, I pastored this amazing church, and uh, I've got a sermon all ready to go. Can I leave for a few hours and... and, and and film the message, and then I promise I'll come right back. <laughs> and you can ask, I text them, I text the team, I say, hey, get ready, we're going to have to film the message this week. And the doctor said, no, you can't leave, you could die if you did that, you need to stay right here. And what can I say? I just love preaching to the best church on the planet. <laughs> I love you, Car Church. <laughs> but when Jesus turned to the Pharisees, the experts and the teachers of the law, and said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick, and I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus was not differentiating between some people are well and some people are sick. Please hear me. Jesus was saying, I came to work for those that are willing to recognize I'm not well. That are not pretending like they don't have a problem. In fact, there's probably only a few qualifying characteristics that we need to possess uh, that, that qualify us and, and get us ready for God to heal. You just have to know that you need it and ask for it. That's what Jesus was saying. Religion says you're succeeding as long as you can keep carrying on pretending like you don't have a problem. But Jesus has never been interested in us hiding our, our unhealth or covering up our symptoms or ignoring our issues. The irony is that at times, 
We want it to be well. And, and, and you know I'm talking about emotionally and, and, and spiritually and mentally or whatever. We've wanted to be well so we can come into God's presence. We've thought to ourselves, in fact, pro, I, get, I guarantee you some of us thought today, ah, my life's a little bit of a mess, but I, I'm okay. I, I'm, I'm going to go to church anyway. But Jesus is the great physician. I said Jesus is the great. This is the kind of sermon where I need you in the room with me and I need you preaching back to me. I said Jesus is the great physician. Yeah. Having, having symptoms isn't a reason to stay away from the doctor. It's a reason to schedule an appointment with the doctor. In fact, somebody has scheduled an appointment today. It's a divine appointment with the doctor, with the great physician, the healer of, the, of your soul, the mender of what's been broken. We have a great physician. God's power is at work in those that have simply stopped pretending. Jesus was saying, for, for some of us, it's just time to say, I'm sick. I can't handle these issues. I can't get through this on my own. And I'm not talking about you have to be lost in some insane depravity that, that just makes the devil proud. I'm talking about those everyday problems. You just have to be willing to say, Jesus, I need your help. I need healed. That's who Jesus came for. Jesus isn't looking for people that have it all together. Jesus is looking for people that are willing to say, it's all kinds of messed up. But even though it's messed up now, I believe, Jesus, you're the great physician and that you can step in and you can do a miracle. I mean, what good would it do to see the doctor and pretend like you've got no symptoms at all? All you'd be left with is a big fat bill. But we, we, we come into God's presence trying to act like, and, and, and Jesus is the great physician. You might be able to, to trick like an everyday doctor, like, no, I'm good. Okay, well then, why are you? But Jesus sees through it all, yet we still try and come in and pretend, oh, God, I'm the highest place. I, you're all kinds of jacked up, and so am I. I mean, what good would it be to go to God and, and do our very best act like we've, all we'd be left through is, is, is going through religious motions but missing out on the miracle. While there were people getting set free, the Pharisees were right there in the vicinity of Jesus, often in the same room with Jesus, but all they were doing was keeping themselves busy, hiding all their symptoms. Jesus is the great physician looking for people with issues, looking for people with shortcomings, looking for people raised in hard circumstances, looking for people that don't quite know how to do relationships right because they never saw relationships done right in the ways that they were raised, looking for people that are a little screwed up because they've been screwed with. Jesus is the great physician, and I did not come, Jesus says, to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And when it came to this woman with an issue of blood, the Bible tells us in, in Mark uh, 5, 26, that she had suffered under the care of many doctors and spent all she had. But here's the line I really want to lean into. Instead of getting better, she only got worse. She went to all these doctors, but instead of getting better, she only grew worse. And, and she had internal bleeding. She had an issue that was happening on the inside. When, when nobody can see that you're bleeding because it's something that's happening on the inside, it, it, it's that emotional state that you haven't really told anybody about because you're afraid of what they might think of you because you're supposed to be this great leader. You're supposed to be this amazing mom. When you're bleeding on the inside, that can be the loneliest place. Sometimes when nobody else even knows that you need healing, that can be the hardest place. Because when you break your arm and you get a cast put on, come on, you can walk around like this. Hey, anybody want to sign my cast <laughs> and get all the sympathy in the world? But when it's on the inside, when it's on the inside, that can be, that can be a hard place. When it's, when it's that 3 a.m. anxiety, when it's on the inside, when, when I have no reason to be because a lot of people would be envious of my life, but somehow on the inside, I'm, I'm yet depressed that can be a hard place to be because nobody even knows. It's you, and, and you're good at covering your condition. We all are. Our Instagram feeds are full of our highlights, and, and, and they're, 
they're put together, but, but sometimes it's those places that are, that are deep down that are hardest to handle. And this women's issue came with complexities. It wasn't just a physical issue, but it was all the related issues. Because of this, this bleeding, and according to Jewish custom, she would have been considered ceremonially unclean. That meant that, that, that relationship by relationship, she lost all the people that were most important to her because this had been 12 long years. They couldn't get near her or be in her vicinity because if she was unclean and they, they touched her, they too would become unclean. And so her issue, even though it was so difficult to deal with, also put her in isolation. It came with related issues. And, and, and sometimes, have you ever noticed this in life? Sometimes this issue produces another issue. And then this issue produces two more issues. And then those issues produce some other issues. Come on, it's like our issues are, reprodu- our issues are having kids. <laughs> issues producing. And, 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 and after a while, issues having issues having issues, you can't even remember. It's gotten so complex, you can't even remember what the original issue even was. You, you, you can be, maybe today, it, we're, in, we're in worship and you're praying for a financial breakthrough, but that's actually just the issue of an issue of an issue, and somewhere along the way, as you were raising your family and trying to establish who you were and, and trying, to, trying to do life, somewhere along the way, you kind of lost sense of, of your identity, and, and it's actually not, not finances that you need, it's an identity fix that you need, but it's an issue that produced an issue that produced an issue. She's about to reach out and grab the garment of the great physician, but up to this point, nobody knew how to fix her. And she'd gone, the Bible says, to many doctors. What it actually says is that she had suffered at the hand and the care of many doctors, but instead of getting better, she grew worse. So watch this. Here's where God was speaking to me. She went to people and places that promised to make her well, but only made her worse. Why had she spent all she had on these doctors? I'm betting it was because they'd each promised they could help her with her problem. See, I think it's easy at times for us as Christians to to maybe forget about where we once were or or even forget about where we were yesterday and look at people that have gotten tripped up in some sin and say stuff like, I can't believe you're there. I can't believe you're saying what you're saying. I can't believe you're doing what you're doing. I can't believe you're going where you're going. But I think sometimes people need the opportunity to say, hey, the only reason I did that, the only reason I drank that, the only reason I said that is because I thought it might help my hurt. That's what sin is. Watch me. Please hear me. Sin is simply going to the wrong physician. She went to people and places that promised to help her with her problem. And instead of getting better, she only got worse. Sin is simply what happens when you let the devil be your doctor. Nobody wakes up and says, you know what, today is a good day to become a sinner. (laughs) Nobody's like, you know what, today I'm just, I'm just going to go out and do some sinning. (laughs) These doctors made promises. She was desperate. Anything to get out of this pain. Anything that can fix it, anything that can relieve it, if there's anything that can be done for it. And and the enemy will always be quick to make false promises and write you prescriptions. Here's the problem. Watch this. The the enemy's prescriptions always come with side effects. I'm I'm picturing these ads that pop up on TV, you know, Advanatan. I don't know if that's a real medication, but... It's a good name if you're in pharmaceuticals. Advanatan. Let's go with it. And there's somebody, you know, like dancing in a flowery meadow and just radiating joy and, and Advanatan, you know. And then right at the end, there's like 15 seconds where somebody that somehow is talking supernaturally fast <laughs> lists off like, like seven paragraphs of possible side effects. Advanatan might cause eye twitching and seizures and, 
you know, uh, headaches and, and, and untimely death. And you're like, what was that? <laughs> you said it all so fast. I, did you see something about, about untimely death? And, 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 and the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Or you can put it this way. The side effect of sin is death. But don't make any mistake. The enemy will, 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 will show you yourself dancing in a flowery field and then, and then right at the end of this advert playing in your mind for about 15 seconds, the devil will talk in a way that you can barely hear it and list all the side effects that come with this slight release of the symptoms. But when the devil, and don't make a mistake, sin will temporarily relieve the symptoms. Yes, it will. That's why, some, that's why it's so easy to sin. Nobody's been like, it's hard to sin. No, it's easy to sin because it temporarily relieves the symptoms, but it always comes with side effects. Isn't it crazy how sometimes some of the ways you try and feel better just makes it that much more bad? Have you ever done something to feel better and thought it would work but just made it worse? Have you ever, have you ever ate something that made you feel better for a minute? Come on, but then just a little while later, you're like, now my stomach hurts because I ate seven rolls of Oreos. <laughs> whatever, whatever your comfort food is, you know, insert whatever. It, it's, it's why it can be so easy to get chipped on, but sin. I, 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 it can help with the symptoms, but it comes with side effects. And, and it's maybe like, my life's a bit of a mess, and, 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 it, and it's real subtle. It's real subtle. It's real subtle. The devil will come and want to be your doctor. Oh, your, your life's a bit of a mess? Uh, well, well, here, I got a perfect prescription for you. Um, if, if your life's a bit of a mess, here's all you need to do. You can take one of these uh, in the a.m., one of these in the p.m., all you got to do. If your life's a bit of a mess, hey, guess what? Her life's more of a mess. Just talk about her. Just gossip about her. Just let all your friends know about her. And, and the craziness of her life will make your life seem a little less crazy. Here's the prescription, but it comes with side effects. Don't really know who you are, and, and, and you're struggling with a sense of identity, and, 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 and maybe your parents didn't really know who they were, and they struggled the same way, and so they never really spoke over you about who you were and, and you're trying to figure it out and, and in the middle of this pain the enemy is quick to, to write you a prescription don't know who you are all you gotta do all you gotta do is, is, is be overly critical of others and then you won't have any time to be critical of yourself now you can just be a cynic just, just, take one, just take one of these big pills every day. Just be a cynic. Just be a pessimist. Just criticize everybody and everything, and you're going to be all right. What, hey, what they did to you wasn't right. And, and they left, but they forgot to take their pain with them. So, so and suddenly the enemy comes in and says, hey, you got some pain? I got the prescription. Just don't let anyone in ever again. That's all you got to do. Just take the prescription, and, and, and you can avoid pain just hold everybody out, and, and you can have some pretend friends, and you can show up at church, and you can even give some people some high fives, and you can have some Facebook friends, but, but all you got to do if you want to avoid this kind of pain, just take the prescription called isolation and live all on your own and think you got to get through it on your own and, and just, just go through it on your own. That's all you got to do, but it comes with some side effects. Oh, he, here's, a, here's a prescription the enemy loves to write. This, this comes in multiple bottles. Blame. Oh my goodness, if, if, you're, if you're going through something, a, a lot of the times, the issues that we're going through, we've actually caused ourselves, come on, if, we, if we're honest, for three seconds, we, but, but, but the enemy will say, hey, here's all you got to do to feel better, just blame everybody else. Blame your teacher, blame your parents, blame your pastor, you know, blame your pastor, you, you can blame your pastor if you want. I'm, you, <laughs> Blame circumstances, blame the fact that you don't have what they had, and if you did, you could do more than they're doing. All you got to do is blame. You can just blame, blame, blame. But, but hey, it's going to come with some, some side effects, and pretty soon you've got all these prescriptions. And here's where it gets really crazy, though. You have to take other prescriptions to, to fix the side effects of these prescriptions. My, my grandma, Tilly, if you care to know about her, 
uh, she was a Pentecostal powerhouse. Yes, she was. And uh, physically speaking, she was tiny. She was probably, what, 5'4". Not even that. Five foot. My wife's saying five foot. Physically, she was, she was, she was tiny. But in the spirit, she was tall. Yes, she was. And she spent the, the end of her life, the last several years of her life, uh, w- without a lot of, of material wealth at all. In fact, uh, what she did have, she gave away. And, and so she didn't live in a big home. She lived in this kind of little tiny home that would just had, you know, bedroom and kind of a dining room, kitchenette, a little, a little couch. But I'll tell you what, she used that place to pray. Yes, she did. And, and, if, and if you care to know about it, uh, the only reason that there is a cause church today and the only reason that any of us are even sitting our butts in these seats today and, in fact, meeting with God today in this place is because there was a time where the enemy pulled on my life, but I had a praying grandma Tilly that pulled back and said, not on my watch, and she prayed me into my purpose, and God showed up and spoke to me about promises. And, and, and towards the end of her life, um, she, she was frail. And, and so she had all these, she had all these medications and, and these pills that she would take. And, and one day I was, I was with her and I was asking her about it. I said, Grandma Tilly, how do you have, how do you, why do you take all these pills? Hey, you know, like those, those pill organizers? She, she had one of those. And it was like every day was overflowing with all these pills. I was like, how, why are the doctors giving you so many pills? And, and so she explained to me, and she went through the different days, and she said, well, well, this pill, um, it, it tends, one of the side effects is that it brings my blood pressure up. And so this pill brings my blood pressure back down. And I've got to take this pill because it helps with this pain in my body, but one of the side effects is that it makes me tired. So then i got to take this other pill because that gives me a little bit more energy so I can pray for you because you've been running wild. And, and, and so... <laughs> Pretty soon, you can hardly even organize all your prescriptions and all your pills. And so it is emotionally and spiritually and in every way in our life. When we take a prescription that didn't come from God, the side effects, it makes us run to something else. And then that something else comes with more side effects, and that causes us to run once again to something else. Pretty soon, we're trying to manage all these prescriptions to help with the pain caused by other prescriptions, and we can't even remember the original problem. It's like I I, I blow up on on people in anger because it protects me from feeling vulnerable. I'm protected, but the side effect is now I feel kind of empty. And there's a void, and sometimes I don't feel like my life has a whole lot of purpose, and since I don't have, like, uh, I feel like a lot of purpose, now I'm just living to do whatever I can to get the, the next promotion, or, or to get uh, a little bit more popular, or, or to get a few more likes from people. And there's side effects with each problem that requires another prescription, until you go to God, the great physician. I said, until you go to God, who is the great, I I feel like you keep missing your opportunities to clap today, until you go to Jesus, who is the great physician. But maybe maybe that's where you're at today, that that something that promised to help you only hurts you. What you thought was going to heal only made it worse and only hurt. And it sounds like for her there were some side effects because she spent all she had, but she was still living in this physical and emotional and mental hell. And, and watch me, what she wanted was right, but where she went to get it was wrong. It, it's, not that, it's not that what you want, it's not that it's wrong. It, it's right. It's just maybe where you're going to get it that's wrong. And then it says she heard about Jesus. She heard. She heard. And she couldn't get that close to people, so she must have just had to kind of lean in to try and get just a little bit of what people were, were talking about, Jesus, this, this one that was healing the sick, that was giving sight to the blind and, and, and hearing to the deaf and, and raising up the lame, and, and that they were walking and, and leaping and dancing, and, and somehow she heard. And, and the Bible says that faith comes by hearing. And she heard and faith sprung up in her heart. 
She heard, and all of a sudden she found some hope. She heard. But can I tell you today that hearing was not what healed her? This was important. Faith comes by hearing. You got to hear. That's why we preach. That's why I'm up here shouting and sweating and wearing my little microphone today. We got to preach so you can hear. That's why we believe in speaking life so people can hear. There is a hope. But hearing is not what gets you healed because the Bible also says faith without works is dead. So you can hear and receive faith, but then you can kill that same faith with inactivity. Most of the time, in my experience, when somebody, let's not say somebody, let's just say everybody, let, let, I'll include myself in this. When we're stuck, most of the time, it's not because of a lack of education. It's because of a lack of action. Most of the time when we're stuck, it's not because we don't know what to do, it's because we don't do what we know. We, we say we don't know what to do, but that just makes it easier to not do what we know. Well, I just, I just don't know what to do. Yeah, you do. Yes, you, you just, I, I don't, I say it all the time. I don't know what to do. Yeah, no, actually, it's just, it's hard to do what you know. <laughs> it's, it's rarely that. Okay, let me say it like this. Some of us have been coming to church for years, but it's not taking notes on a Sunday that counts. You know what's never helped a single pain or, or, or a pinched nerve or an ache? You know what's never cured anybody? The aspirin that's still sitting in the cupboard. Saying amen and turning around and continuing to do all the same stuff and then wondering why, why nothing has helped is like leaving the aspirin in the cupboard and wondering why it hasn't helped with your headache. What God says, we got to hear. It's important that we hear. But at some point, it's got to be swallowed. It's got to be taken in. It's got to get in your blood. That's why we got people go to every Bible study but get worse. <laughs> this, this woman got her healing, yeah, because she heard, but then she put herself in the path that would intersect with God's power. She did something. She moved towards her miracle. And, and, and I was struck with the fact that in this circumstance, most often when someone is healed in the presence of Jesus throughout the the, the New Testament narrative and, and the synoptic gospel accounts, most of the time when someone is healed by Jesus, it's because Jesus uh, makes a motion toward, Jesus reaches out and touches them. Jesus initiates, Jesus, Jesus touches them. But I was struck with this account because here, Jesus didn't touch her. In fact, Jesus didn't even know she was there. She touched Jesus. And I wonder if today, some of us have been waiting for God to touch us while all along, God is waiting for us to touch him. I'm telling you, gratitude can be a strategy. Maybe you need to touch God today with your thanks. Touch God today with your worship. Maybe you need to feel God. Sometimes faith needs to find something to do. Sometimes faith needs to get up and move towards its miracle. And there's something so good about ha what happens when you get desperate. I'm telling you, today, if you're desperate, that means you are so close to God doing it. Because, because sometimes what will hold us back from what God wants to do is, is simply the fact that we're not desperate enough to do what it takes in order for God to do it in us. It's like, God, I, I, I want you to heal me, but God, I want you to do it this way. You could do it this way, you could do it that way, but not this way. God, heal my heart. And then, and then God says, all right, I will. I'm ready. Here's what I want you to do. I'm the great physician. Are you ready? I want you to forgive him. No, God, nope, nope. We want God to work, but we want it our way. We want God to work, but we want it. This ain't Burger King. We, we want God to work, but we want it our way. It's kind of like going to the doctor and trying to write your own prescription. You're going to kill yourself. You're not a doctor. You didn't go to medical school. You don't know what you're doing. 
But I'm telling you, when you get desperate, you come to a place where there's nothing you won't do. This woman, she crawled through the dirt. She broke every social distancing protocol. This, this, was, this was the first example of something. She was like the person at Target not wearing a mask, coughing all over everybody. And <laughs> Cautious laughter. Can we laugh at that yet? <laughs> where are we at with that? I'm not sure. And, and, she, and she crawled through the dirt. What was, what was up? It was signifying, there's nothing I won't do. And I'm telling you, when you get desperate, you become a danger to the enemy of your soul. There's nothing I won't do. God, if you say to forgive, then I'll forgive. If you say to lift up my hands and worship, even in my weakness, even in this mess, then I'll worship. God, there's nothing I won't do. If you say to give, I'll give, God. If you say to do what I've never done before, I'll do what I've never done before. To trust the great physician, to truly trust the great physician is to trust and to take the prescription. There's a prescription. If you're desperate, it's a good sign God's about to do it. I found out that one of the most powerful kind of prayers is to pray, God, there's nothing I won't do. I've made a habit of praying that kind of way. And sometimes I mean it more than others, but I keep praying it anyway. God, there's nothing I won't do. God, there's nothing I won't do. Sometimes we're missing God working because we're expecting it to be a certain kind of way. Sometimes healing is, is on the other side of surrendering, not just to what God wants to do, but how God wants to do it. God, I need you to heal my heart. God, would you heal my heart? God, I'm praying that you'd heal my heart. Forgive him. No, God. Back to that again. No, God. Here's what I'm thinking. How, how, about, how about you get him, God? How about some Old Testament brand, <laughs> wrath and fire? Get them, God. God's like, nah, I don't feel like doing that. It's not going to be fire. It's forgiveness. That's the prescription. If you want the great physician to work, you've got to do it the great physician's way. How could I complain that my arm still hurt when I tore off my cast? How could I complain that my side still hurt when I didn't let the ER doctor take out my appendix? Don't, here's how God said it to me. Don't let the miracle you did expect be stopped by the method that you didn't expect. Sometimes God says, dip in the muddy waters of the Jordan. I didn't expect all that. So, sometimes God says, if, if you need to receive... Here's what you need, you need to give. Sometimes only the great physician knows how this prescription applies to the problem. It's doctor's orders. It's, come on, it's doctor's orders. It's doc we're, we're constantly trying to, to, to figure it out on our own and tell God what God needs to do and trying to write our own prescriptions, but, but this is doctor's orders. I want you to catch something. We're going to close here. That's why Eric's playing guitar. It's to, it's to set the atmosphere, but also it's a subtle way of saying, you got to shut up. we got more worship experiences coming. <laughs> We've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> Eric knows me. I want you to catch this. She reaches out and touches Jesus. And, and sometimes you gotta, you got to just make up your mind, I will touch God. Let me put it this way, because we're just on this analogy all day. There is no angelic secretary of heaven waiting at the desk saying, no, the doctor can't see you now. You're going to have to schedule an appointment for later. The doctor says, come on in. Sometimes you just, you got to reach out and touch God. And, and I want to show you something. When, when she reached out and touched Jesus, she was healed in her body of this bleeding. And that's what happened immediately. But then there was something else that was going to happen and unfold, and it was going to happen more eventually. It's not just the enemy's prescriptions that come with side effects. The great physician's prescriptions come with side effects too. Touching Jesus didn't just stop the bleeding and make her well. It had side effects. Jesus took the time to stop and turn around and find this woman in the crowd. Why? To tell her, daughter, your faith 
has made you well. Real quick now, earlier in the passage, she was referred to as the woman with the issue of blood, which means what? She was defined by her difficulty. She was called by her condition. Now Jesus speaks to her as daughter, and now the side effects are kicking in. When she heard about Jesus, she got healed of her symptoms, but now when she heard from Jesus, she was also being healed of her shame. The side effect was that her identity was being restored. Daughter, daughter, daughter. She didn't come to be freed of shame. That was just a side effect. Woo, it was just a side effect. She came to be healed in her body, but the side effect of this prescription was that she was healed. Jesus said, go in peace and be freed from your suffering. How can she be freed if she already was freed? Because it wasn't just a physical suffering, it was an emotional suffering. Remember how I told you her whole life had unraveled? Everything had fallen apart. She had been separated from all her relationships. She would given up on a sense of worth. She, she undoubtedly had very little sense of purpose. What was she except a, a beggar, someone that, that people would, would turn away from, would look away and, and cross to the other side of the street? The great physician turned around and said, hey, I want you to know the prescription that you just took, I gotta tell you, it comes with side effects. It won't just be your body that's, that's healed. Your whole life will be restored. It comes with side effects. They're gonna be, you can hug your kids again, that's one of the side effects. You can be restored to a sense of purpose. That's one of the side effects. When you go to the great physician and get a prescription, there are always side effects. Can I tell you today that we worship God because our God is worthy. But you know what? When we worship, it comes with side effects. When we worship, all of a sudden, our problem gets smaller and our God gets bigger. Come on. We, we get... Ah! We, we give because God said to give. We give, but guess what? Giving comes with side effects. Jesus says, hey, I just want you to know, if you take this prescription of giving, Jesus said, when you give, here's a side effect, you will receive. We, we follow God. We follow God because God said, follow me. But there's a side effect. When I, when I follow God, goodness and mercy follows me. It keeps showing up where I go. Blessing keeps showing up wherever I am. Those are just the side effects. Come on, it's going to come with side effects. It comes with side effects. Come on, stand to your feet. I want to pray for you today. And all over the room, come on, let's lift up our hands. We, we close our eyes. We lift up our hearts in the presence of God today. Jesus, we thank you that you are the great physician that you've got our prescription, that you know exactly what we need and how we need it and when we need it. And God, where we've been running to this and running to that, God, not because we want to sin, but God, just we're trying to relieve the symptoms. God, I pray right now for an impartation of wisdom. I pray right now, God, for an impartation of clarity. God, I pray right now that you would fill someone even to overflow with this sense of abiding peace and boldness of faith to know I don't have to run there, here, or the other. But today I'm running to the only one that can fix it, that can heal it, that doesn't just relieve the symptoms, but goes straight to the source. Maybe it's healing in your mind from what's been spoken over you. Maybe it's healing in your soul. Maybe it's healing in your body. Wherever you need it, your great physician has it. I speak healing over you in the name of Jesus. I speak healing over you in the name of Jesus. I speak, come on, let's let the Holy Spirit work today. I speak healing over you in the name of Jesus. God's at work now. I speak healing over you in the name of Jesus. You, you, don't, you don't have to cut corners anymore. I speak healing over you in the name of Jesus. You don't have to speak out those jealous sentences over her because you know who you are. I speak healing over you in the name of Jesus. No more side effects from the enemy. Now you're going to have side effects from God. The side effect of blessing, the side effect of prospering in your soul, 
the side effect of knowing whose you are, the side effect of peace that surpasses all understanding. I thank you for it. I thank you for it. I thank you for it. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if you're here today and you want to be saved, you want to, you want to pray and ask Jesus to, to come into your life and you want to give God your whole heart and you want to be saved, you want to be forgiven of your past, or if you're here today and you want to come back to God, then in the past days of your life, you've known the goodness of God and you've walked in the ways of the Lord, but you just, you just, you didn't mean for it to happen, but you ran to this and you ran to that and all of a sudden you just, you're just finding yourself lost in this world of, of hurt and turmoil and sin. The doctor will see you now. Come on, now's the time. Today's the day of salvation. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed all over the room on the count of three, if you want to be saved today, you want to come back to God, just raise your hand into the air. Both here in person and I'm, and I'm talking to you as well online. Just let us know in the chat there on YouTube, on Facebook, I'm giving my life to Jesus today. On the count of three, one, God loves you so. Come on, two, and raise that hand into the air, three. Thanks for it, I see that hand, I see that hand. Yes, Lord, I see that hand, thanks God. Thanks for it, God. Yeah, I see that hand, thanks God. You're watching online, just let us know. Thanks for it, thanks for it. If you just pray with me silently in your heart now, Jesus, I put my faith in you. I trust that you can save me and only you can save me. Would you wash me in your cleansing blood? Would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Would you raise me up out of spiritual death that I might step into spiritual life? Jesus, today, as you call me by name, I turn around and call on your name, the name of Jesus, the only name by which I can be saved. I thank you for making me yours. God, in this moment where I extend, extend my simple faith, it doesn't really feel like that much, but I believe that in this transaction, as, as I give you my faith, you give me your faithfulness you are well able to save and make me new. Thanks for making me yours and thanks for making me a Christian. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Come on, let's clap our hands and rejoice with people that prayed that prayer and we celebrate with you. We rejoice with